Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Dr. Dave Cotter. I'm the Dean of Academics here at the Command and General Staff College, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this iteration of the, uh, the CGSC Cultural and uh, Area Studies Office, CASO, uh, iteration on the Indo-PACOM series that's been ongoing for quite some time. And I see, I see a number of uh, repeat offenders here in, in the room that have, have attended a number of these. Uh, CASO, under Dr. I, partners with joint interagency and other partner organizations to, <coughs> uh, to continue its series of events and discussions here at the college in support of the U.S. national security and national defense strategy across the broad spectrum of conflict. China and Russia pose particular and named challenges to our national security interests, with China specifically identified as our pacing threat and as a systemic challenge to our, gro our global interests. Uh, today's panel, entitled Key Issues in South and, South and Central Asia and China, will explore these issues and perhaps from a, from a perspective of the, of the dynamics of proximity. Uh, today's session includes three panel members, uh, and I'm going to begin uh, with Mr. Mr. Uh, Brent Christensen, uh, a career uh, member of the Senior Foreign Service of the Department of State, uh, for over 22 years, currently serving as the foreign policy advisor uh, to the commander of the U.S. Strategic Command, the POLAD to, the, to STRATCOM. His most recent overseas assignment was as a political and economic counselor and frequent acting deputy chief of mission at the U.S. Embassy in Dhaka, Bangladesh. He serves as a variety of other roles including uh, involving South Asian issues, including as a Pearson Fellow in the House Foreign Affairs Committee Subcommittee on Asia Pacific, <clears throat> Deputy Director of the Office of Regional Security and Arms Transfers in the Bureau of Political Military Affairs at the Department of State, and the Interim Director of the, uh, for South Asia at the National Security Council. Uh, <clears throat> in the center of the table, Lieutenant Colonel Moore is a Foreign Area Officer of with South Asia Specialty. His last assignment was as a Senior Defense Official and Defense Attaché to the People's Republic of Bangladesh at the U.S. Embassy in Dhaka. He served at the, defense, at, at the Defense Intelligence Agency and in the J-5 of the U.S. Indo-PACOM as a Security Cooperation Desk Officer and Chief of Current Operations Branch. He served in India, attending the Defense Services Staff College, the DSSC, in Tamil Nadu, India, and at the U.S. Embassy in New Delhi. Lieutenant Colonel Moore is an advisor to the Iraqi Army, the Iraqi Department of Border Enforcement, and was a partner to the Afghan National Army Artillery Battery. And Dr. Robert Bauman, on the, <coughs> on the uh, far right, uh, is a historian of Russia and Central Asia. He is a legend at the Command and General Staff College, having taught here for 35 years. He also recently spent four years working as a Ministry of Defense Education Advisor to the Armed Forces Academy of Uzbekistan, under the auspices of the U.S. Defense and Security Cooperation Agency. Dr. Ba Bauman holds a B.A. in Russian from Dartmouth College and a Ph.D. in History from Yale University. In 1979-1980, he conducted doctoral research in Mo at Moscow University as a Fulbright Hayes Fellow. Subsequently, he conducted numerous research, research trips to Russia and taught briefly at the Bashkir State University in Ufa in 1992. Our moderator is the director of CASO, Dr. Mahir Ibrahimov, who we refer to here in the college as Dr. I. Uh, most of us are familiar with Dr. I's very unique background, including his service as a deputy platoon commander in the Soviet Army, a Russian Baltics and later senior Middle East expert in Moscow and the USSR. He helped open the first embassy of the independent Azerbaijan and served as a senior diplomat in Washington, D.C. He saw duty in Operation Iraqi Freedom and was featured as a linguistic genius and later as first senior <coughs> U.S. Army cultural and language advisor during coin operations in the Middle East. He is regularly invited to Europe in support of NATO partners and his regional, for his regional and global expertise. Author and editor or editor of six books, Dr. I's expertise is featured in BBC World News, the Los Angeles Times, and other global venues. He's fluent in five languages and versed in many cultures. And just for your further information, the bios of all these panel members are, are, and the moderator can be accept, uh, accessed on the uh, CASO website. And uh, in uh, my unpaid political uh, advertisement here, the opinions and discussion points of this session are those of the speakers and the moderator and do not necessarily represent the official positions of the United States government. 
Uh, and so I welcome you uh, to, this, to, to this, this session uh, uh, that will be paneled by this, uh, this august group. Uh, and without further ado, I'd like to turn the floor over to Dr. I, who will continue moderating throughout the session. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you, sir, for your support. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today for our next CASO session. Um, by this time, usually this, full, this house is uh, completely full, but I just uh, was told there is an exercise going on, but the people might be still coming in, so hopefully. But we, uh, the good news is it's being video recorded. We have multiple outstations. And for those who, s who missed uh, today's event, they can always access the videos uh, and watch it completely, the complete session. First of all, I would like to thank Mr. Christensen, who traveled all this way to share his expertise with our soldiers, faculty, and staff, as well as Dr. Bauman, and also Lieutenant Colonel Moore, who came all the way from his offices on the third floor to the Arnold Conference Room, <laughs> is also on the third floor. I would also like to thank our Army U, CGSC, and CAC teams for their continuous support. We appreciate the great support and expertise of our in-house experts, Mr. Terry Mobley, Dr. Jeff Babb, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Aldaya, Mr. Brian Stephan, and many others. Next slide, please. To set the stage, I would like to provide a quick overview of the region. South Asia, Afghanistan, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, Maldives, Nepal, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka and the Central Asian states, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, and Uzbekistan. So for those, uh, just for situation awareness, Stan is actually means a land. Means that the land of Uzbeks, land of Kazakhs, etc. So they have a rich cultural and historical heritage. The region is home to some of the world's oldest religions, and are at the crossroads of the historic Silk Road with over a billion people, with India being region's largest country. Before turning the floor to the first speaker, we would like to invite our outstations to start submitting their questions and comments when ready via our CJC Facebook live stream so that we could convey them to the panel to generate the discussion during, Q, during Q and A session. With this, and without further ado, I would like to yield the floor to Mr. Brent Christensen, who will provide an overview covering the strategic context of South and Central Asia and some of the major issues facing the region today. He will look in particular at the roles India China, Russia, and the United States play, as well as some of our major uh, players or factors potentially affecting the future of the region. Mr. Christensen, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. I, Dr. I, and good afternoon, everybody. An additional disclaimer on my part, I'm not currently in any form of South and Central Asia policy role at STRATCOM, so all of my remarks on US policy are based on publicly available documents. Next slide, please. So, as, as Dr. I explained, uh, what is South and Central Asia? This is how the Department of State has grouped the region together since 2006. Uh, then Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice, when she created the Bureau back then, once referred to it as uh, the um, spine of the Book of the World, trying to explain both why the countries were put together and, and why the region was being given new importance. Uh, as many of you know, DOD does group these a little bit differently with India East in the Indo-PACOM AOR and Pakistan North in the CENTCOM AOR, uh, various reasons for that. The NSC has shifted where Central Asia has sat in pretty much every administration. Um, 
And when I first started, this was largely a hyphenated region. Everything was looked at through Indo-Pak or AFPAC or some combination, but that's not really how we view the region today, uh, as we'll get into a little bit more. So why does this region matter? Well, so over 25% of the world's population is found here. India is now the most populous country in the world. Pakistan and Bangladesh are both in the top 10. Since 2014, it's also been the fastest region um, for economic growth uh, every year. Uh, India is now the number five economy globally in nominal terms. It was a major front in the global war on terrorism. I'm not going to speak to a predominantly military audience about Afghanistan and Al-Qaeda, but you also had Lashkari Taiba, Jamaat Muhajadeen Bangladesh, the Liberation Tigers of Tamil Elam, and other groups that were operating here over the last 20 years, uh, many of which have been significantly degraded or, or disbanded. Uh, it's home to two nuclear armed states, and it's the only region where three nuclear armed states are regularly coming into limited conflict. Uh, former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, in his biography re re released last year, said as recently as 2019, India and Pakistan came close to nuclear conflagration. A 2021 report by the Council on Foreign Relations described South and Central Asia today as, unlike in the Cold War, it would be a significant arena of major power competition and the venue for and source of intensifying U.S.-China and China-India rivalries. Uh, next slide, please. Half of the countries that border China are found in South and Central Asia, and China has a great focus on stability along its border region. Uh, previous slide, please. Uh, in addition, uh, other powers do still come into play, especially Russia and Central Asia, as we'll talk about a little bit later. But really, as we look at the region, we need to focus first on India, since that is the major power within the region itself. Uh, India has long had what Prime Minister Modi is now referring to as the neighborhood first policy, focusing on stability in the region and particularly on the countries uh, bordering or very close to India. Uh, while this has been the policy in place uh, more or less since the beginning of India, you know, different prime ministers have had different interpretations at how far the, the neighborhood extends and, and how they interpret that policy, but they've been very focused on uh, their immediate uh, uh, region uh, for a very long time, especially in the context of Pakistan, where there's been mutual animosity since 1947 in the partition, multiple wars, and both countries going nuclear in 1998. Uh, where that conflict stands today, there's been a renewed ceasefire in the line of control since 2021, but as the uh, Director of National Intelligence Annual Threat Assessment that was recently released says, neither side has used the period of calm to renew their bilateral ties, and there remains potential for an event to trigger a rapid escalation. Pakistan has also uh, significantly deepened its relationship with China in recent years, uh, especially as the U.S.-Pakistan relation has cooled. India historically and throughout the Cold War was a leader of the non-aligned movement trying to chart its own foreign policy course. Uh, and part of that uh, also led to India having very strong historical ties with Russia. They are to this day a major purchaser of Russian military equipment, including recently uh, S-400s, although they are making efforts to diversify away to U.S. and other, other sources of equipment. And uh, since Russia's illegal invasion of Ukraine, they've maintained strategic neutrality on Russia and Ukraine and have been a major purchaser of Russian oil in the last two years. With India and China, China's their largest neighbor. Uh, they have an, uh, uh, still a uh, not fully defined border, and it's their second largest trading partner. But it's also their primary external rival. They went to a war in 1962, had deadly border clashes as recently as 2020, uh, and India has been a vocal opponent of the Belt and Road Initiative, publicly skipping the first BRI summit in 2017. For the U.S. and India, a former ambassador described the relationship for uh, many years as uh, one of two estranged democracies. But a shift starting at the end of the Clinton administration and continuing through each successive administration has sought to bring the United States and India closer. Uh, the U.S.-India civil nuclear deal, the major defense partnership, India's robust participation in the Quad in recent years are all signs of how the U.S.-India relationship has changed. That's not to say that everything's rosy between the two countries. Economic issues uh, remain a source of some tension, especially on trade and market access. The aforementioned Russia-India ties, uh, some concerns about democracy and human rights, and events like the um, alleged assassination plot against uh, Sikh separatists in the U.S. last year are all some sources of tension within the relationship that we have to work through. But it remains the focus for U.S. policy in the region. Uh, as the previous administration's strategic framework for the Indo-Pacific, which was declassified in January of 2021, 
uh, says. And as an aside, it's the most JPME 2-like strategy that you will ever actually see in the wild, so I encourage all of you to read it if you haven't. Uh, it makes, as an assumption, a strong India in cooperation with like-minded countries would act as a counterbalance to China and has as one of the desired end states for the strategy that India remains preeminent in South Asia. With India's uh, neighborhood first policy, you know, uh, uh, has a large effect on the other countries in the South Asia part of the region. And for those of us that have uh, served time there, uh, the countries understand that close ties are necessary to India, given its size, its economic power, uh, its uh, regional power. But India can be, as uh, a Bangladeshi once described to me, an overbearing big brother. They can tend to be domineering in the relationship, not treated as, as two equal nations. That has led uh, many of the countries in the region to seek out a counterbalance, whether it be the United States, the United Kingdom, or most commonly China. Uh, Bangladesh, for example, India played a critical role in the founding of the nation, uh, publicly backs the existing government, but there can be significant anti-India sentiment within the government and the population uh, over actions uh, like policies that seem to uh, uh, disfavor Muslim minorities um, or disfavor Bangladesh and trading relationships. Uh, that has led Bangladesh to seek out China as a source of infrastructure investment, military hardware, and a, a, a just a general counterbalance um, uh, to Indian influence. India has similarly struggled in Nepal with Nepal's turbulent democracy over the last 15 years uh, as they've also sought out China to counterbalance Indian influence. Uh, Sri Lanka, which has seen its own share of political woes over the last um, five uh, plus years, is commonly cited as a major example of Chinese debt trap diplomacy. And the current hot spot in India-China competition is actually the Maldives, uh, where the new president has ordered Indian security personnel out of the country and signed a military assistance deal with China in recent weeks, uh, which my colleague will speak a little bit more to later. For the United States part, uh, the Indo-Pacific strategies have also included trying to build ties with these other nations in South Asia. And one of the things that we do remind the countries is that while we consult with India on regional issues, uh, U.S. policy towards each country is distinct and independent. Uh, turning now to South Asia, uh, South Asia is where Russia plays a much bigger role in the region. Russia started moving into Central Asia in the 19th century. The great game, that now horribly misused term for so many things in foreign policy, was originally Russia and England competing for influence in the region, uh, primarily in Afghanistan and surrounding uh, areas. They were all part of the Soviet Union. Um, three of the five are uh, still part of the Collective Security Treaty Organization with Russia and four of the five are members of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, which includes both China and Russia. And Russia has remained engaged in all of them, um, including, uh, well, Putin has uh, significantly restrained his travel since the illegal invasion of Ukraine. He has visited all five of the stands in the last two years. China has become increasingly active in the region uh, over the last several years, uh, seeking primarily stability with many of the countries along its border. Uh, the Belt and Road Initiative is sometimes called the New Silk Road. Well, the old Silk Road ran right through Central Asia, logical fit. And in 2023, they hosted the first China-Central Asia Summit um, with the leaders, including a $3.8 billion Chinese pledge in new assistance. The United States has turned new focus towards Central Asia uh, following the withdrawal from Afghanistan and Russia's invasion of Ukraine with U.S. stated policy on Central Asia to support the sovereignty, independence, and territorial, territorial integrity of the five countries. The primary U.S. mechanism for this has been the C5 plus one diplomatic platform, which last year held both its first foreign ministerial meeting and a presidential level meeting on the margins of the U.N. General Assembly. Uh, so now, uh, with the U.S. policy towards uh, South and Central Asia, the current administration's uh, Indo-Pacific strategy you know, outlines the primary goal as a free and open Indo-Pacific, seeking a connected region, specifically mentioning again, supporting India's continued rise in regional, le regional leadership and a prosperous, secure, and resilient region. And so that's how the U.S. now is trying to see its role in the competition playing out within this region. And with that, Dr. I, I turn it back to you. Thank you, Mr. Christensen, for the great uh, presentation. Next slide, please. The next speaker is Lieutenant Colonel Nathan Moore, who will discuss China's and India's competing influences in South Asia. Colonel Moore, the floor is yours. Yes, uh, thank you, Dr. I, uh, Dr. Cotter, and Mr. Christensen. Um, really going off of what Mr. Christensen has said, I want to go into a little more detail about it, specifically about China and India's 
competition in the region. Um, when we look at South Asia through the American prism, uh, we, we tend to aggrandize the competition between the PRC and its allies, its totalitarian allies, allies is the wrong word, PRC and, it, and some of its partners, and the United States. For much of this region, this competition, and I hope everybody takes this away, is really a competition between India and the PRC, as Mr. Christensen said. And what I'm going to do in this is, is really go through the periphery around India to kind of demonstrate how that competition is going. Uh, but before I do that, you know, a common refrain that I know I heard and I think you heard in Dhaka was that the uh, U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy was an India-Pacific strategy. I heard that from very high-level diplomats and military officials. Well, let's look at that. If we, if we look at the 2017 U.S. Indo-Pacific strategy, there's an entire section entitled Support India's Continued Rise and Regional Leadership. And the strategy also seeks about supporting and enabling our quad relationship. Quad relationship, the United States and India, that's half of it. Um, Japan and Australia make up the other half of that. And certainly our partners and our adversaries use this against us. They actually, they talk about this and can point to our very real doctrine and our strategic documents that rightfully accuse us of prioritizing India over the rest of South Asia. But, you know, th there's a little bit of nuance to this. And something we'll often hear is that that's, your, that's a U.S. ally. And I want to make sure that we understand doctrinally and the way we go about using that term. If it's being used in this context, it's quite incorrect. Um, India doesn't see itself as an ally. It's never pressed for that. No matter how much that may be an aspiration of U.S. strategy, it's not true in either fact or practice. Uh, nor is it something that historically India has pursued. India's longstanding but changing policy of non-alignment. It has roots in the previous Cold War, and it's a constant phenomenon whenever you deal with India or India's worldview. And we, Mr. Christian kept bringing up this, this idea of counterbalance, and that's exactly what the smaller countries of South Asia see both U.S. presence and Indian presence as a, as a counterbalance, and Chinese as a counterbalance to India. Uh, the PRC has made serious inroads into India's periphery. You'll often hear Indian government officials talk about containment. Um, so I'd like to kind of go over a few of those. Next slide, please. And just starting in the uh, sort of the, 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 the southwestern corner of, of that region, we look at somewhere like Maldives, which doesn't actually have a U.S. embassy uh, posted in Maldives. Um, as Mr. Christensen pointed out, the Maldives has a, a recent very pro-PRC new government um, who's promised to remove thousands of Indian troops. I use that term thousands very loosely. There are not thousands of Indian personnel there, although India does have some, had some aircraft, had some small things to be used for humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. But now India has it's sort of encountered that, has announced a new naval base at Lakshadweep, which is just uh, 80 nautical miles north of the Maldives' northern atoll. And the previous government to this one was very pro-India. So you can see this kind of waterbed effect happening in, in a place like the Maldives. Both India and China have huge investments in telecommunications and tourism in the Maldives. And I want to turn it now to Sri Lanka. Uh, Sri Lanka is often held up as this, this quintessential debt diplomacy or, or debt trap diplomacy um, within it. And I want to tell you why. Um, in Sri Lanka, those investments have certainly had consequences. In 2022, Prime Minister Rajapaksa fled Sri Lanka amid a, a massive economic downturn of COVID and crippling debt and paucity of current foreign currency reserves. But beginning in 2006, Sri Lanka really, it really made a strategic choice to go with PRC investments. Um, it wasn't getting a lot of support internationally in its war against the LTTE. And Sri Lanka is often seen as this example because as, even as you know, Prime Minister Rajapaksa's government received a $4 billion line of credit from India, it could not save it couldn't save that government. Um, we often, I, if I take a step back, um, the current uh, president, uh, Vikram Singh, he's asked um, international creditors for a loan repayment pause until 2028 to give the Sri Lankan government some space to meet its, its loan uh, and debt obligations. Further, uh, we often bring up, I think a lot of people, if they know the, the Wikipedia on Sri Lanka, they, they know about Hambantota Port, which has a 99-year lease to a Chinese state-owned enterprise. That wasn't the original terms of the agreement. That's a default. That, that happened because they cannot make their loan repayments. And Sri Lanka is an interesting case because you know, even that very port doesn't produce a lot of commerce. It doesn't produce a lot of tax revenue. It doesn't get a lot of, of traffic. The joke when I was in Sri Lanka was that even the gravel was imported from China. Now, it's a joke, but 
there's some truth to that. We have conference centers completely empty. An airport in Gaul that, that services very few airplanes. Toll, empty toll roads. So that's one of the things about, if, if we sort of look at why is Sri Lanka setting this example of this, uh, of this debt trap. I think those are some of the things you can take with you. But you know, we don't, we don't have an easy road there. And neither does India. India, of course, has a historic, uh, historic deployment in the fight against the, uh, the Liberation Tigers of Tamale Lam, LTTE. Um, lost a prime minister to an, a terrorist attack over that. And, uh, and there's a lot of deep wounds. But for, for the United States and all, how we apply our policy is we have, we have severe limitations, uh, nothing that we did necessarily, but uh, on really in the, in the application of how, how Sri Lanka's army, most of its maneuver forces are all have, have mass you know, sort of gross violations of human rights against every maneuver unit. So it makes our you know, you know, training, equipping, or other assistance under the Leahy law almost, almost non-existent. So it's very hard for us to do these things. Um, in Bangladesh, I was warned in the, to, to not over-talk Bangladesh. We do have two uh, DACA alumni. But I think really to bring out Mr. Krishnan's point is the future of how this competition goes, you'll really see in Bangladesh. We have multiple partners, including our own, like Japan, building ports, the Matabari Deepwater Port. But in, in Bangladesh, that government, it, it bills itself as very pro-Indian. But you should know that doesn't stop them from accepting massive amount, rivers of money from China. And I would say that the infrastructure there in Bangladesh is a little more nuanced. Um, China does, it's fulfilling a lot of infrastructure needs. And it's not always uh, you know, appropriate for the United States or, or any one of us to go, look, you're, you're, you're funding all these infrastructure needs like the Padma Bridge and this power plant. In some ways, that's a good thing. It's always about how it's, is it done responsibly? Is it done well? And we look at our partners, you know, Australia's making huge inve investments, but I, I mentioned Japan. But one thing I can't, leave the Bangladesh sort of competition sphere without talking about. And General Flynn, um, I took him to those camps, and he talks about it too, is the, is the Rohingya refugee camps. And we use the term refugees. Uh, Bangladesh does not use that term um, for a lot of reasons. But, you know, the United States is easily, e easily uh, the highest grossing donor uh, to the United Nations, uh, the UNHCR there, to, to help provide nutritional assistance, to help with the maintenance of those camps. In, in practical terms, China's help has been building power plants that keep the lights on. But what China has moved into in Bangladesh is this role of being a peacemaker between erstwhile Burma and Bangladesh. And the carrot that they offer, and everybody needs to understand that this is a little bit new. It's, we're seeing it in CENTCOM too, but is China as a mediator? And China is holding up the idea that the entire Rohingya population, approximately a million people-ish, could be repatriated back to Myanmar. And of course, you could understand in, in Bangladesh political sensibility, that's, that's a good thing, right, to send them all back. The problem is, is there's no guarantee from Myanmar of the safety of these people or a dignified return. And that's, of course, if we talk about U.S. policy, Ambassador Haas has said, hey, we don't have a problem with the idea of the Rohingya returning to their native land. We have a problem with them being returned under, under unsafe conditions uh, and without dignity. And as I look at a, as a positive of time, I really want to bring out just two more countries. I'm going to leave Pakistan, you know, Pakistan's, that's a very in, uh, singular problem set. But if we look at Nepal, you know, Nepal is really crunched in the same way, but, but there are no maritime borders, right? There are no, there are no third countries in that sort of competition, uh, as much as we are there or Britain's there. In, in Nepal's case, you only need to look back into 2015 and this embargo that, uh, that the Indian government, in fact, did after a terrible earthquake for a lot of reasons, for competition reasons. But that embargo was six months of not getting petroleum and not getting things like cooking oil into the country. And that really, you know, you look forward into 20, 2018, a Maoist government took over. And it has been, as Mr. Christensen has said, uh, very rightly, that's been, it's been a rather chaotic government. It's absolutely apt. It's just it's sort of perfect seeding ground for this competition. And you can watch it every day in small things. Even a country like Bhutan, uh, Bhutan, uh, we don't have an embassy in Thimphu. But we, what does happen is that right now there's, there's a Chinese land grab going on. And the one friend that, that Bhutan has is, is India. But to, to bring that all together, I hope I've, I've made the point of beating that horse dead, is that this competition is not just about us. And we're fitting into it. We need to fit into it well. But I think, back to Mr. Christensen's point, is India's a rough neighbor. And it's got pointy elbows sometimes. And it's not always, a, it's not always you know, those democratic principles that we put forth uh, they don't always uh, ring true in the same way in India. Thank you. 
I will now turn it, uh, yield of, I think I've used up all my time, Dr. I, and I yield the floor back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Colonel, for very interesting analysis. So now we go to the next slide, please. And our next speaker would be Dr. Robert Bauman, who will focus on Central Asian perspective vis-a-vis -vis China and U.S. national security, particularly on ongoing competition for influence in the Central Asian region. Dr. Bauman, the floor is yours. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahimov. Uh, thanks also to Dean Cotter for his kind introduction and to my fellow speakers, uh, Mr. Christensen and Lieutenant Colonel Moore. And I will try to pick up on a few of the threads that they established without repeating uh, anything that, uh, that they talked about. In terms of understanding the competition for influence in Central Asia between the United States and China, which is our focus today, uh, it's necessary to pause for a moment and understand that much of the historical context, much of the present context, was established by Russia, uh, the Russian Empire, and the Soviet Union. You might say they drew up the field, uh, even if later players have entered the game. Uh, <coughs> Russia uh, made its first significant forays into Central Asia under Peter the Great, uh, which goes back uh, several hundred years. Uh, but by and large, the subjugation of Central Asia by the Russian Empire uh, happened from the middle of the 19th century uh, to the, more or less, to the end of the 19th century. Uh, it was a systematic conquest, uh, stage by stage, and of course, uh, the area of Central Asia is, uh, is enormous. Uh, next slide, please. Um, with the dissolution of the Soviet Union, uh, in 1991, uh, suddenly the Central Asian states became independent political entities um, as states with a configuration, uh, borders and whatnot that had not been known previously. The Soviet Union invented these as republics of the Soviet Union and they were given birth as independent states with the blueprint uh, that the Soviets had, uh, had passed on. Uh, so there, uh, not only were their borders uh, somewhat invented, uh, so were the titles of the states and their histories. I mean, there had never been, for example, an Uzbekistan, per se, as an independent recognized state. Uh, those are words that are kind of loaded, actually, in the region. Uh, when uh, President Putin says things like that, uh, that's, that's a way of hinting that uh, these states aren't entirely legitimate and wouldn't exist but for their creation by us. Uh, the Russian civilization. Uh, those are the very kinds of words he used with respect to Ukraine uh, not long ago. And when, when folks hear that, uh, it has special uh, significance. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it's true that from the end of the Soviet Union, these states had to begin inventing themselves as truly independent entities, no longer pieces uh, of the Soviet Union, but now a state. And it meant creating their own brand, uh, working on their own history with a new interpretation uh, where the desired end state is not being part of Russian civilization, part of the Soviet Union, but in fact the desired end state is a robust, independent, culturally vibrant Uzbekistan or Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and, and so forth. So this is an enormous cultural project now that was undertaken, but it, again, largely undertaken with a context of what Russia uh, had left behind. Um, part of that context is, of course, the, the Russian language, uh, which remains influential but has been slowly losing influence across Central Asia uh, since the time of independence. And when you circulate in places like uh, Tashkent, which incidentally was deliberately built up by the Russian Empire and then, then the Soviets to be sort of the main city of Central Asia, it was not one of the great cultural centers of, of Central Asia during its heyday or even at the time of the, uh, of the Russian Empire. Um, <coughs> The language evolution is now mirrored in kind of a generational divide. If you went to school in the Soviet Union, you got 
some serious instruction as a rule in the Russian language. Uh, Post-Soviet, uh, that declines pretty rapidly. Today, if you talk to a 20-year-old uh, Uzbek in Tashkent, there's an excellent chance uh, that they will speak little uh, or, or no Russian. Um, if you speak with someone over 35, there's a high likelihood, especially if they were reared in a city like Tashkent, that they will speak Russian uh, and are, have a certain acquaintance with, uh, with Russian history and, uh, and other things. Uh, so the Russian influence is, uh, is still strong. I use language as a, a category of discussion uh, because it's <coughs> we can all appreciate uh, how vital language is to cultural influence and, and the way that plays. If you go around to uh, uh, movie theaters in Tashkent, uh, the great majority of the time, uh, dubbed international films will be in Russian. Some are actually made in Russian and don't require dubbing. Uh, American films are very popular. Uh, in fact, I would say American films, last time I was there, which was just a few months ago, were still predominated uh, on billboards outside of uh, movie theaters, uh, the latest uh, Marvel action flick of some sort, or uh, when I was there uh, last time I saw Oppenheimer uh, in, uh, in Russian. Uh, all these things are, are very big. The pull of Western, Western culture, American movies, Hollywood, is still very strong, even if folks will watch those movies in Russian. Uh, so this is where the cultural competition uh, plays out. Uh, who's really influencing uh, the most? China, of course, is becoming engaged in all of this as well. Uh, but Chinese movies have not got a big imprint. Um, in, the in the realm of language study, uh, this is where you can begin to kind of uh, count assets, uh, you might say. Uh, China has very much been promoting study of the Chinese language uh, in Tashkent. Um, there's a Confucius Institute, among other things, but there are a lot of programs uh, promoting uh, the Chinese language in Tashkent, and many Uzbeks will try to avail themselves of it. Um, Russia, aware that it's been falling behind, has provided hundreds of language teachers uh, to, uh, to Uzbekistan uh, to try to sustain their influence, maintain the position, uh, even though it still seems to be uh, slowly uh, slipping away. Um, in the case of English, uh, neither the United States nor Great Britain has made an enormous effort to promote English there, although we, we certainly have had some instructors uh, sent over and done some other things. What's interesting about English is most of the energy behind the study of English is indigenous, which is to say people want to study English. That's a language of choice if you wander around Tashkent. And one of the uh, best business opportunities, at least if you uh, look at uh, <coughs> shop windows around the city uh, is to create your own English language school. They're all over the place. There's hardly a point in the city of Tashkent uh, from where you can walk half a mile without finding an English language school. Uh, so it's, it's very popular. The high-end ones are relatively costly uh, by local standards, which is to say they might run $75 a month uh, to, uh, to study English a couple hours, three times a week in, uh, in one of those schools. But it's th they're very popular, and the demand for this is, is obvious. Uh, when, uh, when you go around. So uh, the Western influence uh, through various things, film and, uh, and language study is, uh, is certainly significant. Um, another note uh, contextually about uh, culture and politics, the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine uh, certainly looms in the background uh, politically uh, and culturally. I would say the atmospherics for Russians and with respect to Russia have evolved uh, since the invasion started. Uh, relations are cordial, uh, but uh, there's not quite as much affirmation uh, as there once was. Uh, I would note, for example, that uh, pre-invasion, uh, Victory Day, for example, uh, in, uh, in Tashkent. Uh, Victory Day in Russia, of course, is one of their big holidays, uh, May night supporting uh, victory in World War II, uh, colossal parades, and uh, President Putin speaks in Russia, and there's a, there's a parade in every city. Uh, it's, uh, it's an enormous big deal. Uh, and across the Central Asian republics, uh, it was still a pretty big deal uh, through uh, 2021. For, uh, <coughs> since the invasion of Ukraine, it's gone very, very low key, and there's uh, not much to speak of uh, that's actually going on. Um, let's go to the next slide. 
Uh, the other uh, big domain, uh, of course, of competition is in economics. And here, China's achievements are measurable, and you can see they're expanding rapidly. Uh, in 2023, China surpassed Russia as the biggest foreign investor and the biggest trade partner in Central Asia, uh, in particular, Uzbekistan. Um, and you'll see on that slide just some of these specific examples uh, indicating the way in which the, uh, the Chinese economic presence uh, is, is expanding there, at, and it's certainly at a rate greater than uh, what you see of the U.S. Again, you look at empirical things that you can observe in the streets, uh, and what, uh, what could you notice in the last year or two? Uh, several years ago, three, five years ago, the by far the most visible brand of uh, automobile in Tashkent, for example, seemed to me was a Chevrolet, uh, special model assembled uh, in Uzbekistan, a very popular vehicle. Uh, now there's a big surge in Chinese-built electric vehicles, um, and they are popping up all over the city of Tashkent as are charging stations for these vehicles. The, the change is rapid, and it's so rapid that it's been uh, commented upon to me by uh, uh, Uzbeks uh, that I know. So the uh, Chinese momentum in economic terms is, uh, is certainly considerable. Uh, of course, another political indicator of the importance of the relationship with China and Central Asia is that uh, with respect to the controversy over human rights and the Uyghurs in, uh, in Northwest China, uh, there has been pretty steady silence in Central, Central Asia because no one wants to offend uh, the, the Chinese. Um, so notwithstanding in the Western complaints, you know, which are regularly registered at the United Nations and in other forums. Uh, this is something that simply is not talked about in public venues in Central Asia. Some people do comment uh, in private. Uh, with that, I'll curtail my remarks and we can follow up with questions. Thank you, Dr. Ibrahimov. Back to you. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you, Doctor, for a very informative presentation. Next slide, please. So now is the time for questions and comments. To generate the discussion, I would like to ask the first two questions in English. Of course, in English. First question, what the United States' primary strategic interests are or should be in the South and Central Asia? Should I repeat or it's clear? Okay. And the second question is, some experts often refer to the Central Asia as the region where the balance of competition and cooperation is most evident. How would you elaborate on this expert opinion? Is it clear, the second question? Okay. Who would like to begin with the first answer? Uh, well, I'll jump in on the, the first uh, question. So two successive administrations have said that really the core of our strategy, our strategy for the region is a free and open Indo-Pacific, uh, that that's the best way to meet our vital interests on security, on economics, on values, um, a, a free and open region that, to quote from the White House website, requires that governments can make their own choices and that shared domains are governed lawfully. Uh, it's also important, free and open also means free and open e economically, where um, countries can have opportunities, companies can have opportunities to compete, to engage, and to spur the, that broader economic growth. So really, that's where we're at for the core of the strategic objective is the free and open Indo-Pacific, and so free and open um, South and Central Asia. Uh, I think I would, I would defer question number two to our Central Asia expert. Anybody else would like to add to the first or second question? So. I think that hits it, hits it very well. Yeah. Well elaborated. So the, the uh, Central Asian uh, question would be obviously Dr. Bauman, right? Perhaps. So Dr. Bauman, would you like to? <laughs> well, we, though we have uh, three or four very well qualified uh, uh, folks in terms of the Central Asian region in the audience. So I asked them to pick up the baton and, uh, and help out. I would note in terms of U.S. interests there, um, the, the one good thing about the American position is that perhaps what we see is our foremost interest, which is the 
preservation of the sovereignty and independence of the Central Asian states perfectly aligns with their own ambitions. That's what they want, too. So that's the one thing we've really got going for us. Uh, otherwise, because we are far, far away, uh, don't have a close border, are less economically tied, um, and, and certainly don't have the political leverage that goes with territorial immediacy uh, that, uh, that the others have, um, <coughs> we're, we're not dealing with a strong hand there. Uh, but in terms of alignment of really big goals, uh, there are some important things. I think the view in Central Asia, uh, certainly in, uh, in Uzbekistan, is that American presence, American influence is welcome uh, because it provides a degree of counterweight uh, to the stuff that's obviously there uh, in the form of uh, uh, Russian presence still and, uh, and growing Chinese presence. I would say with respect to China, the normal attitude in Uzbekistan is, well, certainly we welcome their business, we want to engage. Uh, there is a little bit of reticence about what the long-term implications of that might be, uh, and there is caution uh, about uh, Chinese long-range intentions. Um, there is something a little beyond caution with respect to Russian intentions. They understand the Russians pretty well, <laughs> and so uh, there's no deep mystery uh, to unravel there. Uh, but they they want to keep the United States engaged. They would they want to keep Western Europe engaged to the extent uh, that uh, uh, that they can. And so there are regular contacts, um, even though the overall scale of uh, investment and connectivity is not comparable uh, to that of, uh, of Russia or China. But I want to invite some of the other folks uh, uh, to chime in. OK, great, great. Anybody else from the distinguished panel to add? I'll just um, add on the, the, you know, the question on where competition is playing out and examples of competition playing out. I think it's very hard to say that there's any one region where it's more clear cut than another. I mean, competition is playing out globally. You know, look at events in Africa. Look at things that are happening in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, you know, South Asia, Central Asia. Uh, you know, it, it's, major power competition is playing out across the globe. And, and so I don't think there's any one region that's a better example. And, and it makes it a real challenge for policymakers because you really are having to pay attention you know, to the whole world in a way that you, you may not have had in the recent past. Great discussion. Anybody else? OK. OK, great discussion. Great uh, question, Dr. Rai. And the great, great answers, the good distinguished panel. So now the floor is yours. We will begin with Arnold, and then we'll move towards the outstations via CJC Facebook Live with the help of Mr. Stefan. So please introduce yourself, ask a question, or make a comment. For those in the back room, uh, in those uh, back seats, uh, please use these two uh, microphones. Uh, so now the floor is yours. We'll begin with Arnold. Who has the first question? Yes, uh, yes, sir. Please introduce yourself. Thank Ask you. your question. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mark Wilcox. I'm on faculty at the GMO. And mm -hmm. I, I will certainly defer to my colleagues on both sides for more recent knowledge of Central Asia, as my stated. But I wanted to go to kind of key off the competition comment a little bit. I think we talk about competition. We're talking about, you know, okay, U.S., China, U.S., Russia, strategic partners. What I want to ask about is, are there countries in the region that are actively and perhaps successfully playing the Russians and the Chinese off against each other? Okay. Uzbekistan, Great perhaps, and perhaps others in South Asia. Who would like to begin with the answer, please? Uh, I'll give a, yes, a Dr. tentative Bell. beginning, but I think uh, the lots of folks can maybe chime in and add to this. I, I don't think it's entirely clear, uh, but uh, I, I think countries like Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan is diplomatically pretty savvy. Uh, and uh, they easily understand the import of their geography uh, and the need both to engage with Russia uh, and China. Um, you still have a significant force of migrant workers from Central Asia who go to Russia for employment and send money home. That's, that's still important uh, when events happen that make 
travel difficult, uh, like the COVID pandemic or whatnot, that has repercussions uh, back in uh, uh, back in Central Asia. Um, <coughs> so they they understand their strategic interests, uh, and again, this is something that plays to the benefit of the United States. The United States is simply not seen as a threat to become dominant in, uh, in Uzbekistan. Um, to the extent that we acquire influence, naturally they monitor it, but um, we do not pose any challenge to the autonomy of Uzbekistan or other, other Central Asian states, and therefore our presence is, is generally welcome. Great. Anybody else from the panel? Uh, with the exception of yes, India, yes, yes. Russia is really pretty marginal in South Asia. Um, so there it's really is who is balancing India and China better. And for that, and, and I'll ask Lieutenant Colonel Moore to chime in since he's got two years more recent than I do. Bangladesh had been about the best example of balancing India versus China. Uh, prior to 2020 and the COVID lockdowns and the effects on their economy because they had had enough economic growth uh, that they were able to avoid some of the, the worst of the debt traps and bring in the, the Chinese infrastructure, the Chinese military equipment, um, and uh, you know, other influences and able to balance pretty effectively there. Uh, with the effects of the COVID lockdowns in their economy, I don't know how true that was uh, post-2021. Very true. Post-2021, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah very true post-2021. But, uh, you know, post-2021 or into 2021, we saw um, in Bangladesh, we saw like the Ukraine war started. And I, I tell you that I didn't realize how much influence Russia truly had in South Asia. But back to Dr. Wilcox's, and I want to make sure I understand the question correctly. The question is, are we seeing a power play China off Russia anywhere successfully? I mean, India would like to. I'm not going to characterize it as successful. Uh, it's certainly the case that, that India has a lot of weapons, Russian weapons that China doesn't want them to have. At the same time, I don't know that, how do I word this right? I don't know that they're properly maintained and that they, they're pr getting the things that they need to get because of Russia's war, current war. In, in, so, so is it really saying that they played them off each other? I can't say that. I can't uh, give that kind of, I think it would be an aggrandizement, frankly. But it's possible. Uh, it's, that, that's the one country I can see, uh, ah, but who wants to do it? That doesn't mean they've been successful at doing it. So. Great. Anybody else on the panel to add? We good? Okay. Is that answers your question, Dr. Wilcox? Absolutely. Appreciate it. Very good. Thank you for the great question. Thank you, panel, for the great answers. So now we are moving to uh, the outstation, sir. And after one question from outstation would be you. One question from outstations. Uh, Mr. Stefan. All right, Dr. I, we have a question from Sierra Charlie. Okay. And the question is for the panel, with the new developments between India and Maldives, how do you think the U.S. is going to play a role here? Or what approach is the U.S. going to take? Is the question clear? OK, who would like to begin with the answer? Yes, Colonel, please. I can do, you oh, Dr. Ahead. Bauman. Ooh, OK. No, I'll, I'll take it. Um, you know, we, we've, watched, uh, we've watched that uh, relationship in India, Maldives, in China. We've watched it flip-flop. And I would tell you that, for the most part, what we've done, especially if you look at the country security cooperation plan for Maldives, and I haven't seen the most recent one, but we usually had a North Star approach of trying to maintain the, the things we did there. So we did JSETs through SOCOM, or through SOCPAC, rather. Um, we did small boat training with our paramilitary, and we tried to, to keep it very much like, okay, we're still a partner that's non-threatening. I think to go back to, to Dr. Bauman's, we're not seen as really encroaching on Maldives' sovereignty. I mean, we can always maintain that. And that's something I predict that we'll continue to do, that we should continue to do, um, and engage as much as possible. We probably need to increase engagement. If India is that much of anathema, we probably need to test out how, how far we can go. Um, and we've done a lot there. You know, we used to do a lot of symposiums and conferences there. Uh, the Joint uh, Pacific Intelligence Conference was there uh, back, I think, in 2018, 2019. So, you know, it's, it's something that we can actually maybe fill in um, some gaps, but I, we always need to maintain that for, for Maldives. It's always, it has to be about their sovereignty, what they choose to do with their resources. And of course, we have to also hit, you know, present aid in ways that sometimes only our government partners can do. I mean, climate change is probably the biggest thing for Maldives. I mean, goes without saying that, that that would have to be where our, our sort of interagency approach kind of, kind of takes it. So that's my prediction. Hope it's a good one. 
Thank you. Anybody else from the panel? Mr. Christensen. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll just add that in terms of what Lieutenant Colonel Moore was saying on increasing U.S. engagement, we do now have um, a confirmed mm -hmm. ambassador to the Maldives. For a long time, it had been a dual accreditation to our ambassador to Sri Lanka. Um, we have had the opening ceremony for an embassy in the Maldives. I'm not sure what the progress is, uh, you know, given some of the, the um, uh, events of the last few years um, in getting that open full time. I'm not sure in the status of that, but the intent, uh, if it's not there already, is to have a dedicated U.S. Em em embassy in Mali, then that will give us more um, interaction and more ability to do things uh, with the Maldives. Anybody else from the panel, please? It's a great place to be a dad. Colonel, for that one. anything to add? Dr. Brahman? No. Nothing? Okay, great. Great question, the, uh, the outstation, and the great answers, the distinguished panel. Thank you so much. We're going back to the Arnold. Sir, please introduce yourself, ask your question, or make a comment. Yeah, my name is Andrew Barrett, um, a resident student here. My question is probably most specific to you, sir. On your map of India, on your slide, it showed um, Kashmir as uh, part of India. I thought that was unique. I'm going to, uh, yeah, my, my stuff is on my PowerPoint okay. talk about it, but I'm not going to, I don't want to address it here in this public forum, but, but thank so, you for that question. So my question, uh, I'm actually a reservist back home in a small town in New York. I have a friend who's from Kashmir, so it's sure. kind of a small world, and, and he's got very unique opinions on <laughs> Kashmir mm -hmm. as uh -huh. a region. From a policy perspective, is the status quo something that, something, is the status quo of Kashmir something we should pursue in other border tension regions, or is it something that there's a more agreeable solution that we should work towards? I'm, I'm just like curious, just right. as, I'm not trying to set you up with a hard question, just it's a, it was unique to me. Your there, there is a policy answer, and I'm gonna defer to the State Department right? okay. uh, for the policy answer, but I would say that the, the Kashmir problem set is not, uh, it's not fungible to a lot of border problem sets. Um, okay. And I, I intentionally did not want to talk about it here. Not, not there, it's its own, it's its own problem. It's deep in partition, and it's deep in, in the psyche on in both Pakistan and and, and in India. Um, I, I would caution anyone of taking, of applying the lessons of somewhere else, or trying to extrapolate lessons from it and, and applying it. Uh, otherwise, I now yield the floor to the policy solution. Uh, so, I, I, I'm not um, going to be able to solve the Kashmir problem today. Uh, you know, I would just. Uh, uh, playing off what Lieutenant Colonel Moore said, you know, each disputed border situation uh, would have to be dealt with in its own way, given the, the differences in the parties involved, the differences in the various histories of um, uh, how those situations came to be. So there's not anything that I would generalize or universalize um, on how we might deal with those situations. Great, great. Anybody else from the panel? Okay. Is that answers your question, sir? No, it did not. No, it did not. <laughs> so, and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, not really. But. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> not really. We'll solve the Kashmir problem by the next time, by the okay. next panel. Okay. Are you, are you in the South Asia elective? I am. We'll talk. We'll talk really hard. <laughs> It's great discussion. Thank you very much for the great question, and thank you, for uh, panel, for the great answers and the great discussion. So we are taking another question from Arnold. Uh, so who has the question? Yes, sir, please introduce yourself. Ask your question. Uh, Dave Peterson, current CGSC student. Uh, so uh, looking at the different transnational organizations, I was wondering what you felt that the current strength of the CSTO is. Or what are the other kind of regional actors, for example, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, if they're kind of stepping up any sort of influence in the region? Great, great. Uh, Mr. Christensen, please. So with respect to the CSTO, uh, you know, it's always been questionable how valid that organization was. And where we're actually seeing the current tensions within the CSTO is not in this region, but with Armenia and how Russia and Armenia have been interacting over the last um, several months, which I think calls in the question on whether the CSTO is a valid organization for any of its members. Um, uh, in terms of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, uh, that's one that, um, you know, given China's presence, um, India is also a participant, uh, that it perhaps has more legs, but I'd be very curious to hear Dr. Bauman's thoughts about both, both organizations. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, with respect to the uh, Shanghai Cooperation uh, Organization, it, it seems to be moving more or less steadily along, and it does bring up another point that uh, hasn't been touched on very much, and that is uh, the slowly increasing visibility of India in, uh, in Central Asia as a player by virtue of their economic growth uh, and, of course, their uh, uh, large uh, demographics. Um, government to government contacts between India and Uzbekistan uh, have certainly ticked up uh, in, uh, in my estimation. Um, but there's a long way to go before Indian influence there is, uh, is profound. Um, as for the uh, uh, any kinds of uh, military uh, in engagements, uh, most of the Central Asian states are being really clear, careful about that uh, these days. I'd be interested to have the impressions of Lieutenant Colonel uh, Adalo or Colonel Retired Slade or, or uh, Dr. Poloni uh, on, on any of this. Uh, they may be tracking some of these organizations more thoroughly than I am. Okay, anybody else from the panel? Nothing, okay. Okay. John, 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 is, never to too, John is never too shy to speak up. It just seems to me that both the SCO and the CSTO they're in the same place they were 20 years ago. Yeah. It, it, you'll hear a little rumblings and then just not much of anything. Just to quickly add, uh, John, you don't have anything to. Okay, so CSTO, Shanghai Cooperation Organization, there are a number of other organizations those major players are part of, which is the uh, BRICS, BRICS. Uh, uh, Brazil, Russia, India, China, South Africa, Argentina, and Iran applied. I'm not sure if they already uh, full mem got the full membership or not. Uh, Argentina declined to join after their government changed. Oh, that, that's right. That's correct. Maybe last, like latest move. Mm -hmm. And there are a few other countries expressed that interest. And there is also Eurasian Customs Union, which is Russia and Eura uh, China are part of it including some of the former Soviet republics. So the point is some of those organizations are more realistic, effective, and efficient. Some of them quite quite uh, lousy, kind of. Um, there are some other organizations. You know, the South Asia um, Association for Regional Cooperation right. has mm -hmm. largely been um, moribund because of the India-Pakistan issues. Uh, uh, BIMS Tech, which I forget what that all stands for, which spans over into Southeast Asia, was trying to get off the ground um, uh, you know, before the COVID lockdowns kind of limited some of those things there. So there's been various attempts at groupings, but we haven't seen anything emerge to even the same degree as, say, ASEAN in terms of yeah. a regional cooperation body. Exactly. Anybody else from the panel? Okay. Is that answers your question, sir? Thank you for the great question. Thank you, panel, for the great answers. So who has the next question from this room? Yes, sir, please introduce yourself. Ask your question, make a comment. Very much appreciated your, uh, your, your, your uh, comments. It's been refreshing to hear something so succinct to the point of policy in the United States. Thank you. I'm going to pose the question <laughs> to you as an outsider looking at and seeking your views on domestic uh, policy in the international space. If the free and open Indo-Pacific, each of you have commented on, is the policy and strategy in a trending, threatening environment where you become increasingly isolationist, where to next? What is your horizon where you become in your trend waves, in the sine waves of your history, it speaks to your past and your possible future? Do you, if you become more isolationist, how do you act, how do you behave in Central Asian states? Your Indo-Pacific strategy links the Central Asian portion with East Asia, North Asia, how does that work in the future? Your outlook, not your crystal balls, noting we never got issued one in the military. I seek your outlooks for how would that play out? Thank you, sir, for the great question. Who would like to begin with the answer? Distinguished panel? So, so I think fundamentally, uh, you know, the Indo-Pacific is not going away. Um, and the free and open Indo-Pacific as a policy has now spanned several administrations. Uh, so uh, you know, regardless of what might happen in future US elections, we've seen the policy from uh, kind of both sides of the aisle and it's largely the same. 
uh, because of the importance of the Indo-Pacific region to the global economy, to global security. So I don't think that that's going to go away. Anybody else? No, I, I completely agree with that. I, I worry, you know, I have concerns about this too, and I'm probably not the best venue for, for me to do it, but one, I want to thank you for your question, because uh, it's, it's, it's very adroit. Um, one of the complaints we always had at PACOM, and I know Phil was just in here too, Lieutenant Colonel Kerber, uh, was always that, okay, the strategy has moved to the Indo-Pacific, but where's the money? And I worry that as we start to talk about moving, I, I don't like to use the I word, isolationist, uh, I, bad word, but uh, a, a, as you do that, you know, we, we thought we had less, you know, we thought we had a positive of funds then. And, and I think if we were looking in my crystal ball, kind of the outlook is I, I would always worry about that. I don't think the policy would change. I think you're exactly right that there's just, this region's just too important. I mean, we, we, Dr. I briefed about how, how many people are in this region. It affects you, of course, I mean, you being the country of Australia, five eyes partner, ally. So, I mean, that that's where I would see the biggest like downfall is, okay, is the, is the money there to, to, to cooperate, to act in this part of the world. So, anybody else think it's that? a concern? Dr. Bowman, Mr. Christensen, is that answers your question, sir? It's about the position, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> So th this is our new uh, exchange, uh, Australian exchange officer, right? We welcomed him uh, recently. Uh, this is the new mayor. Was that? Yeah, who replaced uh, Colonel uh, uh, Mustafa, uh, who has been a great asset to us as well for years. Now we have a new partner, and we already started to cooperate with him. So thank you. Welcome again. Um, all right. Who has the next question from this audience? Yes, sir, please. Director DiGiamo, so for any of the panel members, well, really what I think I've seen here today is a great presentation, you know, by, by you all. Thank you. But we almost have two distinct subregions in, in here, right, Central Asia, South, South Asia. Three major um, eh, competitors kind of within the space. Where do you see things that are very similar between what China, India, and Russia are doing within Central Asia and then also comparing the – Contrasting that against um, South Asia, Great how, how do you see kind of these, these two neighborhoods, right? Where where the big key nuggets within our, are those three players of India, China, and, and Russia? Anybody to begin with the answer? I want to think about it a minute. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, the, I'm with the Department of State. I'll speak without thinking. I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, we're the diplomats here. Um, uh, so I, I, I think there is a commonality in that uh, everybody's priority is stability on their borders and stability in their neighborhoods. But uh, while sometimes that intersects where sometimes, you know, Russia pursuit of stability in Central Asia and Chinese um, uh, pursuit of stability in Central Asia may have much more in common than how China pursues stability in South Asia and India pursues stability in South Asia, and where one's version of stability could be seen as a threat to the other. So I think that that's where you see some of the common factors between the two. Um, uh, you know, it's because China and Russia are um, probably more aligned than India is with either of the other two. Anybody else to add from the panel? Dr. Bowman. Uh, and uh, just thinking out loud, uh, I think it was in January that uh, China and Uzbekistan announced uh, what they termed, uh, if I'm not mistaken, an all-weather partnership. Mm -hmm. um, it sounded, it resonated a little bit like uh, the uh, uh, unlimited partnership that they declared between China and Russia <laughs> a few years, few years ago. All-weather is a little different than, uh, than unlimited. Um, but again, it's an interesting metaphor that causes you know, lots of possibility for, uh, uh, for uh, uh, speculation. Um, Russia has a long-term relationship with, uh, with India. Uh, India, and as, as a nine-aligned state, always had good relations with the Soviet Union, and by and large has had a successful and effective relationship with the Soviet Union uh, since then. Um, and of course, China has, China and India certainly have their issues, and so this gives Russia a great opportunity to exploit those issues and sort of operate as a friend 
to, to both sides, in a sense, and get from both sides things that they very much want and, uh, and need. The situation is a little bit different in Central Asia, which Russia feels by entitlement, by historical entitlement, it should culturally, politically dominate. Uh, China doesn't quite feel that, but China definitely wants an open playing field where they can exert strong economic influence. Um, so while there's uh, a bit of a relationship, a competitive relationship in, in each region, uh, the, the ground rules, the history differ uh, just, uh, uh, just a little bit. Uh, Central Asia is, is in a way a new playing field. It's, it's a new script because it's only been independent for uh, uh, 34 years. Um, and so lacking a uh, deeper history, uh, there's uh, more room to, uh, uh, to maneuver. The population growth in Central Asia is one of the things that makes it interesting to China as a big potential market, not to mention also, of course, as a big energy supplier. So there's lots of uh, reason for China to pursue that relationship and hope perhaps that in the long run, their economic influence there will be ascendant over Russia's historical and, uh, and cultural influence, which in, in many respects uh, seem to be in decline, although when Russia rattles its saber a little bit, it quickly gets everybody's attention. Uh, and again, the Russia's move in Ukraine uh, has served as a stark reminder uh, that you don't want to ignore uh, Russia's concerns. Um, though it, the situation in Kazakhstan is certainly very, uh, very interesting. It was just a couple of years ago that uh, Russia had to help quell a little bit of a, an insurgency, an uprising, a political uprising in, uh, in Kazakhstan. And Russia feels as though it hasn't been properly repaid uh, politically uh, for that. Um, Kazakhstan has been reluctant to be supportive of, uh, of Russia in its Ukrainian endeavor, uh, partly because the, uh, uh, the implications seem all too clear to uh, Kazakhstan. You share a border with Russia, uh, there are certain concerns that come with that uh, state of existence. So it's a difficult comparison uh, to make because there are some different factors at play, uh, but the competition is, is undoubtedly there. And uh, China's ambitions are, are are pretty large, and, and guarantee this will play out for a long time. Yes, Colonel, please. Uh, sir, I, I'm kind of fixated on, you know, you, I think your question was about the, the differences and the similarities between this region and, and that, because Central Asia and South Asia. And I, I actually worry that the, the similarities with South Asia have far more to do with Southeast Asia than they do with Central Asia. Now, there's, there's all kinds of ways they could tie together, but I'm really caught up on the differences of, I, I do think Mr. Christensen's right that everybody's looking for security on their borders, but when you start to look at South Asia, and specifically in the SLOC, in the sea lane of communication, um, you start to see PRC influence that is quite disruptive, uh, maybe not as intentionally as it has come out, but there's, there's an effort there to, to gain the commanding heights, right, to get control of that, and, and what they really want to secure is that SLOC, and I worry that I mean, that's how I'm framing it. That's how I'm seeing it. I'll probably have a better answer at 2 in the morning today when I'm thinking about it. I'm like, well, that's interesting. And, and we used to, that, that lumping together of South, you know, South and Central Asia and, and, and really how those fit together, I, it's, it's somewhat artificial. So I'm, I'm, I'm reticent to make the, the comparison. Ah, oh, here's, how here's how it, I think it's actually quite different. And that's what I would take away with that. I think one of the big differences is there's not a Russian bear sitting right there with armies ready to go. Um, but Russia has a lot of influence. I do think they're, they were a bit player, but there's a lot of influence in India, a lot of influence in Bangladesh, and, uh, and that can't influence? be ignored. Russian influence, you said? Russian influence, absolutely. And I think, I think this, this, where's the money being made? I mean, where's the, there's, there's just a lot of military hardware being sold and a lot of, a lot mm -hmm. of things that go to the Indian, uh, the Indian economy and the Indian needs. Thank you, sir. Anybody else from the panel? Okay. Um, is that answers your, your question, sir? Thank you for the great question. Thank you, panel, for the great answers. Uh, yes, sir, please, your, your question. Introduce yourself, ask your question, make a comment. Mm -hmm. Hello, gentlemen, Dr. Hernandez here. Uh, my question deals with uh, stability. And it has been mentioned that, that stability is a goal for many of the players 
in both Central Asia and uh, Southern Asia. And uh, two of the big boys in the neighborhood, China and, and Russia, uh, they also believe that it, stability is important, but their actions deny or their actions demonstrate that they frame stability differently. Uh, Russia by, in our view, taking over Ukraine and perhaps more chunks of their empire. China has ambitions on Taiwan and all the other uh, parts of the, of the China Sea, South China Sea. So th their vision of stability is distinctly different from, from ours. Does that provide the U.S. a window of opportunity to be an outside player with best interest in that sense and, and therefore a more powerful uh, mediator, if you will, in both regions? Thank you, sir, for, uh, for the question. Who would like to begin with the answer? I think, you know, absolutely, uh, you know, one of the things, you know, both Russia and China are fundamentally transactional partners, and everything with it is transactional and looked at through the, the lens of how is it benefiting them. I mean, China is looking for stability along their border, stability internally through economic growth, which sometimes means exploiting the resources and also of others, um, you know, whereas, uh, you know, in our alliances and partnerships, you know, there there's more commonality of values. It's not purely a transactional relationship. So it does provide some opportunity there, um, especially when we can point to um, you know, things where uh, the Russian or the Chinese influence hasn't gone um, so well for the countries involved. Great. Anybody else for Russia? OK. Is that answers your question, sir? Thank you for the great question. Thank you for the uh, great answers. Um, before we go to the next, thank you so for coming. W before we go to the next question, just to, to add, uh, you know, I, I, when I was doing a research, I'm not East Asia expert, but I always constantly, I'm just trying to learn as well. Um, a lot of things to do with perceptions in that region, perceptions. Um, perceptions, misperceptions, you know, we always have that as humans, right? Uh, misperception in geopolitics, uh, leads to big tragedies because the geopolitics is not like about truth, what is true or what is wrong, right? It's a kind of chess game. Like uh, a man found the hat of truth and put it on and started to tell the truth. He went home, told the truth his wife, she divorced him. He went to work, told the truth his boss, so he got fired. So he got into a lot of troubles uh, because of this hat of truth. So that's a bad example of geopolitics because geopolitics means whatever benefits your national security. You support your national security objectives or your partner's national security objectives, right? This is a game, chess game. So uh, misperceptions, I firsthand experienced several bloody conflicts upon the demise of the USSR because those uh, newly independent countries uh, new leaders didn't understand geopolitics. They would make like straightforward uh, statements against Russia, and Russia was still powerful, next, next neighbor, right? Or Iran, etc. As a result, uh, they would lose territories, etc. So they didn't understand the rules, and that led to the fact that they lost some, they lost the game, essentially. Uh, misunderstanding cultures. I think we, as average Americans, across, being across the ocean, we have this issue, right? Don't know, we don't understand other cultures always. We witnessed that in Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera. I was on the ground in Iraq. I witnessed that. So it's important. I think that was part of the question as well, right? This is all important. Perceptions, misperceptions, misunderstanding of cultures, misunderstanding of geopolitics, regional or global. So this is all important, particularly for the policy makers or policy planners, if that makes sense. The next question from this audience. Who has the next question? No questions from this audience. Yes, sir, please, introduce yourself. So 
Uh, you showed a map, right, of the Bureau of uh, Central and South, or South and Central Asia Affairs. It's very different from the way DOD looks at it, right? It's split between U.S. Indo-PACOM and U.S. Central Command. Do you think there's a there's a there's a gap there? there there's issues with miscommunication between the different bureaus uh, and DOD, or, or is that kind of been kind of fixed maybe since over the last 20 years or maybe even more? Uh, so, the, you know, there were some uh, kind of historical reasons for that split, particularly um, given some of the hyphenation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, but if you go back to OSD policy, you know, while it's different uh, DASDs for um, Afghanistan, um, Pakistan, Central Asia, and for, um, I think, South and Southeast Asia, they both still fall under the um, uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Indo-Pacific um, Affairs. Sorry, I'm trying to get my, my renamings correct. Um, so, you know, that helps some in terms of the policy interactions back with state. Um, but, you know, wh when Lieutenant Colonel Moore was giving his answer on, well, Southeast Asia seems to fit better, I was thinking to myself, that's a very Indo-PACOM view yeah. right there. <laughs> <Agreed>. <laughs> but but there, there, are, there are overlaps, but I think we've worked, um, worked through it pretty well, and, you know, some of the value of having the DOD COCOM structure the way it is, um, you know, still persists to this day. Great. Anybody else from the panel? Colonel? There's a lot of value to, to that, that, that split, but I've, I've personally witnessed that split come about and hear, hear the CENTCOM desk officers calling us with the very Pakistani t talking points about something we're doing or something. Like and so it's problematic, but I think the short answer is yes, it's beneficial. Okay, so Dr. Bowman? Uh, nothing specifically related to that, but back to your comment about perceptions. Uh, right. One thing uh, did occur to me, and, and sometimes we think we're talking about the same thing and we're not. Um, I'm reminded uh, lots of times in, uh, in Tashkent I was talking to high schools or school kids or whatnot. And I recall uh, an instance uh, when, as a practicing historian, I asked a little group of high school students uh, you know, what they had been learning uh, in school. And uh, they'd been studying you know, forms of government and, uh, and politics and, uh, and democracy. And uh, I said, well, what ex can you give me an example? What exactly were you learning? And, they, and uh, one young lady, uh, probably a freshman or a sophomore, uh, piped up, she said, well, uh, for example, I, I learned at school that uh, uh, Russia is a democracy because they have elections, and uh, Great Britain is a monarchy because they have monarchs. <laughs> and so I said, okay, well, we should re-engage re on this, but uh, uh, it's an example of uh, <clears throat> the way terms mutate when they cross cultural and, uh, and political frontiers. Thank you so much. You know, the, the, the understanding of cultures, I mean, I, I am a culture geopolitics guy. I always thought that, and you know, I always tried to tell everybody, culture is important, geopolitics is important. So, because sometimes you, you can say something very seemingly minor and so deeply offend somebody uh, from another culture, it could be incredible. Like happened when I, I was with and among Russians, which I witnessed, I mean, uh, since I've been with them for many years, but yet, uh, uh, anyway, so, but you, you say, he, he was trying to say that Russian are, Russians are the best. When I say, but maybe it depends on the human, but that's so deeply offended, that person. So from a closest friend, he became my like, enemy when I was a cadet. So there's certain feelings, certain uh, aspirations you don't want to even touch from another culture. And then you're talking about the strategic culture of the entire country, right? It's China, it's Russia, very different cultures. Uh, you know, China tends to apply to soft power usually, less to hard power historically. Russia could apply both if necessary, like Ukraine is an example, right? So, um, and the perceptions, kind of part of it, very close. Um, so who has the next question from this audience? Yes, sir, please introduce yourself, ask your question. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Terry Mobley, U.S. Department of State representative here at the Command and General Staff College. Um, I kind of have my own opinion on this, but I was curious yours. So if you think about the potential of a conflict between the United States and China at some point in the future in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, you know, China has long been concerned 
about the ability of the U.S. Navy to block their energy supplies through the Malacca Straits. So thinking about that context, what country in either Central or South Asia do you think is the most important to China in terms of having alternative uh, supply routes for energy supplies? Okay, who would like to begin with that? Quiddle? I guess I have no choice. Do you, can I ask a, a follow-up question to that? Do you mean most important by geography or most important by military capabilities? Well, you, there is a Belt and Road Initiative in Myanmar and a pipeline being built um, in Myanmar, and that could be it. Uh, but it could also be, I don't know that Pakistan's, the pipeline running through that is, uh, is quite so done or secure, but that could be it too, right? I mean, I, I think there's, you know, if I, if I have to answer off the cuff of it, I'm thinking about it militarily and who can, who besides us as a partner can, can truly stop that straight and block it, and it's India. But who, who do they need? I mean, they, it seems very obvious that they're building a lot of this infrastructure is to bypass that anyway. Now, it could be in, in somewhere like Thailand. As I understand, there's a Krabi a, a Kra, a Kra, a Peninsula um, right there at Krabi. There's, there's an, a, an attempt to build something there as well to get around the straits. It seems kind of close. But Myanmar has it, or has a way to do that. It's not done, as does Pakistan. Both could be equally important. Um, Maldives and Sri Lanka, you know, they can't, yeah, they, they, that doesn't solve the problem that you're talking about. Um, so I would put those two, but it could go through Central, Central Asia too, couldn't it? So that, my, my vote is Myanmar and, and Pakistan. Sorry. Anybody else to add? Ms. I, I would just tie Dr. in that, that, that indeed China is actively pursuing expansion of its infrastructure network um, with Central Asia uh, to facilitate the uh, movement of, uh, of gas uh, for example, and lines running through Central Asia would not be subject to much influence based on what was happening in the South China Sea. So mm -hmm. that would certainly give them uh, a viable alternative. Mr. Christensen, please. And, uh, really, I mean, your number one answer is Russia. Um, I mean, not part of the region, but that's the, yeah. you know, the, the, where the infrastructure exists already, and we're already seeing, you know, China buying considerable amount of Russian fuel, um, uh, you know, at present. You know, as the other panelists have said, you know, China's um, doing a lot of infrastructure projects, both for alternative access to ports, alternative access to energy, and things like that. But, uh, you know, which one of those would be the most viable in the near term, um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I, if I could refine my answer, the closest to the source with the secu most securest way of transporting it. Maybe it is Russia. Don't discount Iran. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. Great. Anybody else from the panel? Okay. Is that your uh, answer to your question, uh, Mr. Mobley? Thank you for the great question. Thank you, uh, distinguished panel, for the great answers. Anybody else has any questions from this audience? Yes, sir. As always, nonstop. That's great. I mean, so much energy, intellectual energy. I really enjoy it. Right, Please, uh, sir. Gentlemen, uh, Major Luke Werner. Uh, so would, would continued uh, influence and investment in Southeast Asia help the U.S. Um, balance China, maybe specifically infrastructure or manufacture? Um, and then, you know, heading into our own election cycle, how do we make people in the U.S. care about what our policy is uh, in that region. Okay, the good question. Yes, please. So <laughs> the, yeah. So one of the challenges that uh, we have in kind of countering Chinese influence um, is just you know we're, we the U.S. government aren't really doing large scale infrastructure projects overseas anymore like we were in the say the 50s and the 60s. Uh, kind of our model of development assistance has changed over the years. You know, development assistance is one of those things where it, you know, surveys have shown over the years that the population thinks uh, foreign aid is 10% of the budget at times, and it's usually less than 0.1%. Uh, so it, it's we have various mechanisms that have been built up over the years. Um, the Development Finance Corporation is an attempt to uh, provide alternative financing to countries. 
um, some of the other um, initiatives under, under the Indo-Pacific strategies of the past two administrations. Uh, the Millennium Challenge Corporation tried to get at the infrastructure project but has some very rigorous standards that countries have to meet in terms of governance, democracy, anti-corruption uh, that, that are often very hard. Uh, so, you know, it, it is a real challenge for us. Um, you know, it is some place where, um, you know, sometimes partners are more effective. Uh, you know, Japan does tremendous work. The J Japanese International Cooperating Agency, JICA, does tremendous work all over the region. Um, in the kind of projects that the, U the U.S. Um, development agencies don't really do much anymore. Uh, you know, the, the, the importance of, uh, you know, foreign policy um, uh, and the value it brings to the American people is one of those things that, uh, you know, is, is something that we try to do, we're trying to do better. Um, you know, election campaigns tend to get boiled down to sound bites and there's not necessarily the direct tie-in until, you know, the congressman's constituent has a lost passport or gets in trouble overseas, and then they see the real benefit of our embassies um, overseas. Uh, but, you know, I think, uh, you know, certainly China is not going away as an election issue. Um, uh, you know, India, um, the, the Indian American diaspora um, is increasingly politi politically active and very interested in continued U.S. engagement with India. Um, in a way that benefits both nations. Uh, so, you know, some of those elements are going to be coming into play as well. Couldn't Anybody have, else from the panel? Mm -hmm. You know, I couldn't have said it better. The one thing I would add is, as we're, you know, military practitioners of this out in the country team, never turn down, you know, never, never, never find a way out of a staff Dell or a CODEL. Bring them in. Show them everything we can. Give them the full brief. Open kimono as possible. And that, that I think that translates back into, you know, that's, that's the only way sometimes that we can affect that. And if you don't know what those are, those are delegations to the usually to the embassy, but as a especially for the data, we do have people here who are in the state partnership program for wherever they are. That's a great way um, get it in there and, and bring bring people from that state to see it as well because that uh, that'll have the influence that Mr. Christensen is talking about. I think. Anybody else from the panel? Uh, I would only uh, add. I don't. I don't know that there's any short-term way to no. address that problem. Uh, Long run, uh, we could. Uh, spend a little more time teaching kids geography uh, and, uh, and some other things. Um, no one uh, in you know, ordinary brush encounters, hardly anyone I ever spoke to had the slightest idea where I was or had been when I talked about Uzbekistan um, or, even, or even Central Asia for, uh, for that matter. Uh, indeed, I had to spend a little time with my grandchildren to get a couple points across about uh, the globe and geography and uh, things of that nature. So um, if, if folks can relate to it just a little bit, uh, just, just recognition uh, generates a little bit uh, of interest uh, sometimes. Um, so that, that's a bigger term project. But yes, it is noticeable that uh, at the moment there's not a lot that excites interest in foreign policy in the general public. Anybody else from the panel? I guess part of the answer to your question probably would be when I was in the diplomatic service in DC, I learned one thing that part of the US uh, political system is the so-called lobby, special interest groups. So this is the real venue when certain uh, groups are well organized and funded. They influence the, uh, the senator, the congressman. Uh, the, the most uh, powerful are oil lobby, right? The natural gas and oil lobby. Then the Greek lobby, I think than uh, Jewish lobby and Armenian lobby in Washington, D.C. They have a number of organizations, how they influence their constituency because the, the congressmen, senators are interested to be reelected, right? And that's a legal part of, their, of the political system. It's not a secret. So let's say Massachusetts has a big community of ethnic, certain ethnic group. It doesn't matter which one, but there's certain ethnic group. So. They're well organized, they have their, their organizations, and they're constantly meeting with their congressmen and senators. And they are influencing uh, the policies, realistically influencing the policies towards that particular country. That's, that's uh, the, the realistic approach which is taking place. I witnessed in the early 90s, and then I even I wrote some articles about it. And this is a legal part of the political, part of the democracy. So does that make sense? I don't know if you, I'm sure you know about this. <laughs> so 
Anybody else from, the, uh, from, from this audience? OK. No other questions from the audience? We're almost uh, uh, about the time. I think uh, we can. If there are no other questions or comments, uh, Dr. Carter, do you have any, any final uh, closing remarks? Use this opportunity to ask a question. Oh, yes, Dr. Carter, please. Um, well, I wanted to refrain until she, but throughout this conversation, we've heard about the intersection of, uh, of Russian and Chinese influence in, in these regions. Um, and we've talked a little bit about potential uh, diplomatic seams that perhaps the U.S. could exploit. But what I didn't, I don't, um, it's not solid in, in, in my perception right now is the level of friction that may or may not occur or may, not, may or may not be present uh, between the, the Russians and the Chinese in the two different uh, regions. And I wonder if you could speak to that for a moment. Okay. Who would like to begin with the answer? Colonel? Dr. Bowman. Russia and China obviously have a relationship at the moment, but they also have some divergent interests, and they try to manage that, uh, that competition. The uh, friction points are not that severe at the moment because they're not necessarily after the same things. Um, for take, talking about Central Asia, for Russia, Central Asia is a source of human labor. Um, it is a place with whom they, they want to do business. Um, they're not, uh, China's a big energy consumer. Uh, they're looking to expand their sources and they're seeing potential, uh, Central Asia as a potential large, sustainable growing market. And so uh, they're definitely after, uh, after that. Uh, they're not at the moment on a collision course uh, with, uh, uh, with Russia. Uh, there may have been a little bit of concern about Kazakhstan and uh, how Russia views it, how, how China views it. Um, but r right now, there's, there's nothing that makes any p particular friction point heat up a lot between those two countries. I think they, they feel that their uh, current accord, uh, again, this unlimited partnership, uh, still transcends some of these smaller things since their competition is manageable. As for the way it plays out in Indo-Pacific, South Asia, I couldn't say. Uh, I, I think in South Asia, I mean, you don't have the, the same friction that you could have in Central Asia just because of um, where they're both trying to extend influence um, and the spheres just are not overlapping to the point of causing friction. I mean, even in the, the sales of military hardware, and both Russia and China sell a lot of military hardware to, or have sold prior to you know, 2022, um, uh, to the countries of South Asia, they're not really selling competing systems. I mean, a lot of where Russia has been selling are the higher end things, your S-400s, um, some of the things like that, where a lot of what China's been selling has been um, more of the lower end equipment and have not been selling their higher end systems. So you don't even have the potential competition there. Um, yeah, so it, it's, uh, as you look in the other countries where Russia has some stake in South Asia, uh, where their interests um, and the Chinese interests are, are overlapping, they're not really in conflict. Great, Great discussion. Colonel? Okay. Anybody else from the panel? All right. Dr. Carter, is that that answers your question? Thank you. It's very helpful. Great question. Great answers of the panel. Anybody else from the room? Okay, so now I think the time, the, great, uh, the right time to wrap up the session, right? Everybody would agree? Okay. Uh, next slide, please. These are some of our capabilities and active partners across the country and globally. We always remind that just for situation awareness, right? And we're constantly expanding. Next slide, please. The final slide contains our contact information for any related questions. The video and related information will be posted within about one week after the panel on CASO website. Okay, and uh, uh, 
other army venues for further educational purposes. You can also scan this code for CASO website access with your phones, right here. Uh, sir, would you have any closing remarks? Nothing further. No. Just thank you, gentlemen, for a very, very informative panel. Very much appreciate your presence here today. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you for your support. On behalf of all of us, I would like to thank our panel for sharing their very insightful expertise with us. This concludes our session. Looking forward to seeing you very soon. Thank you.